The most common question that I get, would you just tell me what to do? Fine, here's six things I'd do to run a more calm, sustainable, and heckin' profitable accounting firm in 2024. Number one, most firm issues, I hate to say it, are a reflection of the owner's issues. Oh, hell no. So let's start with a punch right in the grief bone. Double check your why. Consider what the heck it is you're doing on this hamster wheel that you're running on. Too many people go out and start a firm to prove a point. A point to someone who ultimately doesn't give a shit about them. But if you're working yourself to the bone, stop to consider why that is. Until you take care of the underlying root of that problem, you aren't gonna workflow your way into something more sustainable. Best thing I ever did here was actually decide how much money do I need to make? And if you don't define this, you're kind of just working towards this ambiguous thing that will always lead to more. But if you work out how much money the business needs to make, the game becomes getting to that figure in the most efficient way possible. So if you add a new super profitable client, you give yourself permission to cut a couple unprofitable clients. But without those constraints, man, in my case, like I was always just kind of pushing towards doing more. Now, number two, let's get tactical. I'd be building around recurring revenue only. Now for context, I had an 80 year old tax firm that when I got there had 1,600 clients and not $1 of recurring revenue. Mm, what if I can make good money on the project work? Mm, what about that cleanup job I can do in my slow time? You tell me I'm supposed to just walk on past a $100 bill on the sidewalk? That's exactly what I'm saying. In fact, many aspects of firm running can be boiled down to finding a willingness to walk past those distractions. But the beauty of recurring work, listen closely here, is it recurs, meaning it is my new floor and I'm now building on it. When I take on that cleanup project, I have all the friction of new work, of figuring everything out for the first time. Even if it is a pile of money, in six months time, I'm right back to where I began. Compared with recurring revenue, an ongoing project, even if it takes you 12 months to make the same money, every month I get more efficient and it never ends. Does this guy not think I know what recurring means? Other great things about recurring revenue, it pushes you to deliver value year round. It becomes easier to be a embedded part of your client's business rather than doing a thing for them once and then they just forget you exist for the rest of the year. And as you move towards ongoing support, you'll find clients begin to think of you in terms of FTEs or the replacement cost of having to hire an employee to do what you do. And this is a really good thing. I don't want my prices benchmarked against I don't know, average accounting rates. I want to benchmark against the cost of hiring a controller or a staff accountant. A $5,000 a month engagement with an accounting firm will get you a long ways. $5,000 dumped into one more employee salary? Yet another person to manage? That has only a fraction of the expertise that the collective of my firm has? Please, forget about it, forget about it. And when my clients realize I can be a part of their business on an ongoing basis, they're happy to cut that monthly check to me and have one less person to manage. Third, I gotta be conscious of me. No thine self. There's a bunch of different versions of this. The most common is probably from the book E-Myth, where people largely fall into one of three buckets. You're either a technician, you like doing the work, you're the pie maker. You're a manager, you like overseeing the work and you think in terms of systems. Or you're an entrepreneur, you have too many ideas, are easily distracted and generally drive your team insane. Just got back from the conference with some great ideas. And I'll admit, it's easy to live in denial of the fact that one of these is you. I'm an accountant. I can, I can do all these things. And which of these buckets I fall into isn't important. Squirrel! But having the self-awareness of what you are will help you build a better team to support you. If you are a technician, it means you love doing the work. And it means you need to be slow to hire. Otherwise, you'll spend all your time managing people rather than doing what you actually enjoy. And being a technician is completely fine. I actually don't subscribe to the whole... Well, until you work on the business, you don't have a business, you have a job. It's perfectly okay to be a technician and want to do the work. Just know it will come at the expense of building a big team and probably building a bigger firm. But does the world need one more big firm? If you are a manager, it means your blind spots are gonna be not thinking beyond the status quo. You can systematize the shit out of what we're doing today. But if that thing we're doing is horse repair and Mr. Ford just set up shop across the street, no amount of systems will protect us from that threat. If you are an entrepreneur, you need to be thinking about hiring pretty much from day one. You'll have to learn to shut your trap and stop overwhelming your team. And you wanna get to the point where your ability to think bigger picture supports your team rather than running them around in circles until squirrel. Now fourth, I'm gonna find my happy niche. And I know we're all sick of the specialization and niche marketing talk, 
but the best version of this is finding the type of client you're going to enjoy working with. There's a group of people out there for whom doing work won't feel like work, who you would enjoy just spending the whole day shooting the shit with. And for me, honestly, it's firm owners. That's why I enjoy doing this stuff, going to conferences. For you, that might be beekeepers, taxidermists, game dev companies, aviation pros, food truckers. Somewhere along the way, somebody decided work needs to be suffering. You know, the whole, don't make your hobby your job. Imagine enjoying something and actively avoiding it, then calling it career advice. I won't drone on about the benefits of specialization here. In short, when you're for a specific type of person, you can generally charge more for the same work. But today, most of us are not in a place where our clients are the same folks we would be hanging out with otherwise. And the fact it isn't that way today doesn't mean that it can't be that way tomorrow. Did he say tomorrow? Not actually tomorrow, like soon-ish. If you're looking to start working with a new type of client, Consider what is the quickest way that I could have a hundred conversations within this space? Not with people who all do the exact same thing in the space. Within every space is like an entire ecosystem. I wanna have a hundred conversations within that ecosystem. Along the way, I'm gonna make a few friends and faster than you realize, you will have a network that you can begin building a firm on. And you're not just fleecing these people to build your firm, you're doing it to enable connections for the folks you meet as well, to truly become a part of the community that you enjoy being a part of. Don't forget, your interests are a competitive advantage because it's something that's gonna feel like work to somebody else, but is gonna be fun for you. And to run away from that is to run away from the very coolest parts of being you. Okay, okay. more tactical, please. Okay, number five is tactical. Number six is about the highest margin services. But number five, I'm gonna minimize workflow volatility. The name of the game is smooth. Smooth throughout the year. No spikes, no wicked busy seasons. Mm, but I like having my summers off. You haven't taken a summer off in years. <laughs> you don't know my life. Now, smoothing out that annual cycle, it will come with trade-offs. It means I'm doing less one-off tax work. It means I'm not cleaning up other people's books during busy season. It might mean, it might mean, I only do tax work for my bookkeeping clients. It probably means I'm scheduling my entire year, taking back control of capacity. More on that in next week's video. And even changing the conversation around what the month end close looks like. All the firms today trending towards just doing monthly work for clients inevitably hit the same bottleneck, the month end close deadline. The client is like, what do you mean you can't close my books by the fifth? And you're like, so we can, we just can't for everyone. Then you do this hokey pokey where people pay extra to get it earlier in the month, but then the laggards are still getting their financials at like the 25th of the month. And they're like, why did it take so long to get my books? We overcome this bottleneck two ways. One, we update the books weekly. This ensures we're asking questions of the client throughout the month so that when the end of the month arrives, there's not a full month of work left to do. But two, I'm gonna take the focus off the month and close altogether because my clients by and large, they don't even know how to read a set of financial statements. There's like two or three numbers they probably wanna pull off there. And they're usually related to cash, AR, AP, commission, something like that. Things that don't generally require a full month and close. So rather than putting the focus on the financials, which is 95% stuff they don't need and 5% stuff they wish you gave them three weeks ago, I'm gonna instead give them near real-time access to the info they actually want. If they can get their hands on that at any time, if they just wanna see those figures, the KPIs, not the financial statements. Now, don't get me wrong, there will still be important KPIs related to the financials, absolutely. But I think what you'll find is 75% of what clients want can be given to them without the financials, which takes a bunch of the pressure off of that month and close bottleneck. In fact, I'll give you a really practical way to set up this real-time reporting using today's sponsor, LiveFlow, and our good old friend, Excel, roll the music. Okay, I'm in Excel now, and I've got the LiveFlow add-in right up here. I'm gonna click that. It lives over on the side, or I can fly it around and resize it. In a new workbook, I can pull in any of these QuickBooks reports for any QBO company I have access to. Example, we're gonna run a P&L for the trailing 12 months. I can add budgets if I want, pull that in from QuickBooks. Cash basis, whoop boom, report. Now I can move stuff around here. I can add a little add a little row for, for profit margin or something, put a little formula in, change it to percentage, pull this out here, it means things. And if I break this, whoops, MBD bro, just hit refresh, it's gonna fix it. Now that's just a P&L, but I can use any combination of QuickBooks reports to build my own like real-time package for the client. Maybe they wanna watch specific accounts in the GL. Maybe they're looking at bill pay, accounts payable, accounts receivable. I can come down here and run it for a fixed date range or a trailing number of periods. 
If I run this one with a dynamic date of today, it means it will always be current. I can enable drill down. So if you click on the number, it actually takes you to QuickBooks. I've got filters here. In fact, let me go back to the GL report. You can see I get a whole ton of filters here. It is everything I need to build my own reports and bear in mind, I'm still in Excel. So I can like add in another sheet and set the cells to reference stuff from the reports. When those reports break down the road, it won't break the references that I just made on my own report. And we just set that all up for one company. Look at this. I can change the company that's driving all this data with this little button right here. Look, click of the button, change the company, boom. All those reports just update. Now, don't wanna build your own thing? LifeFlow's got templates you can swipe. It works in Google Sheets, if you're into that sort of thing. But the beauty is it's all of your client's QuickBooks data available right here in Excel. Imagine having all that at your fingertips in Excel anytime you use it. Pretty cool. That's LifeFlow. Check out the link in the video description to learn more. Last, let's talk about building around high margin services. You can build a killer business just doing bookkeeping and or tax. But the really profitable opportunities come from what you can do in addition to those things. I'll give you a few examples. Proactive tax planning. If you're running a tax firm, this is where easily over half of your profits could come from. And it's because proactive tax planning is the only thing we do with an aspect of found money. For all but the most simple 1040s, as a tax pro, you have the power to put money back in your client's pockets with good tax planning. And it's the difference between uh, how much will it cost you to prepare my tax return and how much do I have to pay you to save me $50,000? That is a higher margin service. Another high margin service, believe it or not, tech consulting. If you hustle a bookkeeping firm, you know vastly more about the right tools to manage the finances of a business than your client does. And oftentimes this can yield savings on the magnitude of like employees, eliminating manual work with cloud integrations, the right app for the right job. This is really valuable to your clients, but what makes this even better is oftentimes it makes working with the client actually easier on you. We all know how hard it is to support those clients that are like mailing out paper checks and using legacy systems. Let's be opinionated about the right way to build an accounting stack and help our clients like get to a better place. How about wealth management, huh? If you got clients sitting on a pile of money, they will happily bring you wealth management if they believe you're doing a good job on everything else. Even though wealth management has absolutely nothing to do with that. If you could see the numbers, you would be surprised how many shit tax firms there are out there that are propped up by wealth management, especially when you look up market. But we don't because we aren't financial advisors. Meanwhile, financial advisors are like, mm, tax, I can do that. This won't be for everyone. But if you have high net worth clients, wowie, give this one some serious thought. Last, let's double down on our A clients. The 1% of clients you have today that value you most, who are paying you a pile of money with a big old smile on their face because the problems you solve are so painful for them. If that top 1% could grow into your top 20%, it would probably double the profit of your firm because these are really profitable clients that pay you well because you're solving meaningful problems. Not Steve, whose bill you cut in half and he still complains. So a great next step can simply be asking your A clients, what can we do for you and where can we find more people like you? And if that feels uncomfortable, last week I did a whole 30 minute podcast episode on how to do this in a non scummy way. I'll link that episode. It's on my podcast where we talk about like running small accounting firms pretty much every day. And this was a super, super practical one. 